Hello, my name is Lina Bellar. I'm the director of the Vida County Historical Society, and I am here today to introduce you to Alan Woodrow, youth author of The Curse of the Were Penguin. He was scheduled to perform at the Robertson Theater today, but because of the situation, that could not happen. So we decided to film it here at the museum. So without any more talk on my part, I'd like to introduce Alan Woodrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my name is Alan Woodrow and I'm an author of children's books. And just to clarify, when people think of children's books, they usually think of picture books like The Cat in the Hat. In fact, the first question most people ask me when they hear I'm a children's book author is, oh, do you draw? And I always say, eh, not so well. Then the next question they ask is, so who draws your illustrations? So I tell them, it depends. I also tell them that many of my books have no pictures at all in them, or just a handful of them, because I write a variety of different kinds of books, and many are novels. They're not books for toddlers, but for second graders, or fourth graders, or even eighth graders. And that includes my most recent book, The Curse of the Were Penguin. The Curse of the Were Penguin is my 29th book for children, which I think is a lot of books, but hopefully I'll write many more. The sequel, The Revenge of the Were Penguin, will be out in August, and the third book in the series, The Battle of the Were Penguins, will be out in August 2021. The Curse of the Were Penguin tells the story of 12-year-old orphan Humboldt Waddle. Almost everyone calls him Bolt. Bolt likes to think everyone calls him Bolt because he's fierce and brave like a thunderbolt. But actually they call him Bolt because he bolts under beds whenever he's still faced with anything scary like parents or horror movies or meatloaf. Here's a picture of him. As you can see, Bolt has a few things going against him in the adoption department. First of all, he's 12 years old, and most parents prefer to adopt kids who are younger than 12 years old. Also, he's not cute, and he's not even a little bit cuddly, and most parents prefer to adopt kids that are cute or are a little bit cuddly. So things were looking pretty bleak for Bolt, it appeared he might never have a family of his own. The story of the Curse of the Were Penguin begins when Bolt is called into the headmistress's office at the orphanage with exciting news. A baron from the little known faraway country of Bulgaria wants to adopt Bolt, sight unseen. Given Bolt's uncute and uncuddly appearance, that's probably for the best. Bolt doesn't know why he has been chosen by the baron, though, nor does he understand why he has an uncommon connection with penguins, a feeling deep down inside that he can't quite explain but might be related to the odd penguin-shaped birthmark on his neck. Bolt arrives in Bulgaria the next day, excited, confused, nervous, and those emotions only become more jumbled when he discovers the people of Bulgaria are terrified of the mysterious Baron Cordata, the man adopting Bolt. Here's a picture of him. So things can't get any worse, can they? <laughs> oh yes, they can. They can get a lot worse. In fact, because Bolt discovers the Baron turns into a were-penguin at midnight. Were-penguins, as you may know, are far worse than werewolves. Well, maybe not worse, but different. But I wear anything is bad news, whether it's one of the were-penguins of Bulgaria, or one of the were-ardvarts of Tanzania, or even one of the were-fleas of Brazil. And worse, if anything could be worse, the Baron plans to bite Bolt and turn him into a were-penguin that together they can raise an army of penguins and rule the world. That is, unless Bolt can break the curse of the were-penguin first. You might think from that description that the curse of the were-penguin is a goofy book without a message or a theme. But I hope that's not true. For while it is goofy, at the core it's a book about family and the importance of families. Bolt has often felt unwanted as an orphan and has always yearned for his real parents hoping they might return to the orphanage someday, despite no evidence they ever will. But he learns that families aren't always a birth mom or dad. They can be just one of the two, or none of the two. A family can be anyone who loves you and cares for you, whether that family is a group of bandits who live in a forest, or even a colony of penguins. I'm going to read Chapter 5 for you. First, I'll set it up. Bolt has caught a plane to New York, a second plane to London, another plane back to New York when he realized he took the wrong plane, then finally ended up on the train to Vogelplatz, a fishing village in Bulgaria. When he gets off, there's no one there to meet him at the train platform. 
He runs into a small inn nearby and is met with hostile glances and, and anger from the nearby villagers. He tells the villagers he's there to stay with Baron Cordata, but the mere, the mere mention of the Baron's name sends people screaming and fainting in terror. He is then beckoned by a mysterious fortune teller sitting in the corner. And that takes us to chapter 5, The Fair Fortune Teller's Warning. As Bolt approached the fortune teller, he heard music, as if from a small wind chime. It sounded a bit like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but a particularly spooky and off-key version of it. A woman sat at the table with deep crevices on her forehead and sunken bloodshot eyes. Wispy gray hair peeked out from her witch hat, which she also had a dark, which also had a de dead blackened rose sticking from its side. Her long black dress, with lace and ribbons that looked kind of like spider webs, might have been more appropriate for marrying a goblin. Dozens of golden chains circled her neck, most holding charms such as small penguins, tiny ornate spice boxes, animal feet, and animal toes. One necklace held a long, sharp white tooth. The chains clanged against one another. That was the wind chime like music Bolt had heard floating in the air. Seat, she ordered. Bolt did, and shifted uneasily in his too tight pants. I am the town fortune teller, Blizenda. She spoke with a thick, slightly German accent. Bolt stared at her. Uh, I've never met a fortune teller before. I thought every town had a fortune teller. Uh, not where I'm from. Ah, uh, you must come from far away then. Lizenda absentmindedly played with the white tooth hanging from her neck. You are here to stay with the Baron? Bolt nodded. He almost spoke the Baron's name, but thought better of it. The fortune teller grabbed Bolt's hands and squeezed. Bolt winced in pain from Lizenda's tight grip. Now pay attention. I have important things to say. Do not be distracted by my floppy hat, my melodic chains, or my outfit that might be more appropriate for marrying a goblin. Bolt tried to yank his hands from the ice Grip of the fortune teller, but her grasp was like a vice. Listen to me, hissed Blazenda while squeezing tighter. You are in terrible danger. You're hurting my fingers, said Bolt, grimacing. Blazenda did not relax her grip. She peered deeply into Bolt's eyes. Leave while you still can. Go back to where you came. Beware the penguins, she howled. The fortune teller cackled, but no one seemed to pay her any attention. The rest of the bar pit patrons were too wrapped up in their own conversations to heed a cackling fortune teller. She cackled again, louder. Uh, why are you cackling? I'm a fortune teller! He cackle! She gasped and stared at Bolt's neck and the birthmark on it. The sign! <coughs> Bolt tilted his head. It's nothing. It looks like a bird, I know. I'm not the bird! It is a penguin! It is why you are here, as legend has foretold! She then recited a chant. When the moon is high, beware the mark, where danger looks and penguins bark. For you shall change, you shall transform, when penguin spirit inside is born. What does that mean? asked Bolt. Lazenda cackled again. Bolt fought to stop his shaking knees. I am fierce, I am a thunderbolt. He thought those words, but did not believe them. He trembled. The fortune teller leaned in closer. Your life is in peril. All our lives are in peril. Only you can save us from the parents' evil. You are the chosen one. Chosen for what? Save you for what? I'm not brave or mighty. I'm just someone who bolts under beds. And why is everyone so afraid of Baron Cordata? Someone on the opposite side of the room screamed and fainted. Sorry, mumbled Bolt. The fortune teller released her grip on Bolt's hands to his great relief and clutched the animal tooth necklace around her neck. This may be your only chance. If you free yourself, you may free us all. What does that mean? I don't understand. The door opened, and Blazenda looked up and hissed. The room grew quiet. Everyone stared at the newcomer. He was tall, a giant of a man, whose frame took up nearly the entire doorway. He wore a black overcoat over a black shirt with black pants and oddly white high-topped sneakers. Countless scars ran down his face like lines traced into the earth. When I blinked, the other seemed to be made of glass. A shudder of despair filled the room, as did the smell of raw fish. The man reeked of it. He lifted his hand and pointed a finger out straight toward Bolt. 
Come with me, boy. But hurry, your life depends on it. He dragged the ass out. He sounded almost like a snake, but more slithery. Bolt shook so much that his seat almost toppled over. And that is chapter five of the, of the Curse of the Were Penguin.